Tracy with Transpac Marinas, and we've had quite a bit of involvement in design build in our projects over the years. And our hope with this segment was to show the parallels from all the information that Amanda just delivered to how they translate into real projects in Alaska. We have a list of a few that we'll cover here. And these are projects all over the state and projects with varying ranges of contract value and hopefully ones that will be easily relatable so you can take a lot of her information and see how it worked in these situations. Um, so we're going to start off with Derek and he'll go into a little bit of detail on the channel transient float in Kodiak. Thank you very much. The city of Kodiak had used design build quite a few times in the public works department but the harbor had never done a design build. It had always been design bid build. Um, so we figured this was a nice, small, easy project. They give us a good um, opportunity to try a design build. So we engaged Amanda early as an advisor in what we should do and, and go about it. And she helped us develop the RFP. She helped us a lot in the beginning. And like she said, became less involved as the project went on um, because she set us up for some success early on. Channel Transient Float, it's in the North Approach Channel in Kodiak. It's, it's right around the corner from our ferry dock. City of Kodiak was the owner. The primary contractor was Turnigan Marine. They teamed up with Transpac, who made the floats, and Puffin Electric, who did the electrical work on it. Initially, we had anticipated around $3 million, so we set aside a million and a half, knowing we, we got the matching grant. It ended up coming in much lower than that um, after the, the bids came in. Once we got the bids in, we, uh, we did the best value, and um, turning it ended up being the best value. We got them a notice to proceed in, I believe, December, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, um, and then a notice to proceed with, they, they started engaging with Transpac Designs, their engineering firm, everyone, and um, getting the floats fabricated. All that stuff went on seamlessly behind the scenes more or less. The city was engaged a lot with Turnigan, with Transpac, with Puffin um, in all the design stuff, but realistically that stuff was all happening, you know, without us having to drive any of that stuff. In water work, notice to proceed was given in March and the floats and everything were already on the way. By the time we started, they even got the notice to proceed with the in water work. Mobed in, on-site construction started in March. We, um, Lon left on a, on a trip to go down to a, a PCC conference or something like that. And uh, they had just mobed in the barge. And he was gone for a couple weeks for the conference and then a couple weeks on leave. And by the time he got back in late April, all the piles were driven, all the old floats were out, new floats were in. They were already putting in the electrical. It was, um, it was really close to being done in the month and a half he was gone. I mean, it was that quick a project. That's a nice view of it there at night. So here's some questions that, uh, that Amanda and Tracy put together to ask us to talk about. Why was design build chosen? And that was because it was a small project, we had never done one before. We thought this would lend itself really well to a design build. Another thing that because of the way some projects had gone for us in the past, that single source of accountability seemed like a real benefit to us. Um, the teamwork and the communication, and, and I don't know if this can be stressed enough from, from everyone who's talked about design build stuff, design build really lends itself to communication and teamwork from the whole team. The contractor is engaged with the float manufacturer, the engineers, the designers, everyone early. Um, and because of that, there are, I mean, they have, like Jason said during his presentation, they chose to work together from the beginning to put this project together. So they're already working as a team before the owner even gets into the picture for the most part. Um, it really allowed itself for better management of the budget. Like I mentioned, we, we had initially thought it was going to be around $3 million. I think it came in at 2.1, 2.1, something like that. Um, and that's after we decided to do a couple change orders that were driven by us 
that were upgrades to the facility, some ADA ramp and uh, accessibility and, and some upgrades in the electrical system. And really, the, the speed of this project was, like I said, it was pretty impressive, but I mean, from the time they started tearing pile out of the water to the time they were finished and, and moving out of town was less than two months. So it wasn't a very complicated project. I mean, it was a large piling and 300 feet of float, but um, still pretty impressive on how quick it went. Um, unique aspects of the design build. This one is the first project we've had, like I said, in, in my call to ports. We've got an open project from the ferry dock that's been done for a year, but because of lingering um, punchless items, we still haven't gotten the dock turned over to us. This dock was substantially complete and turned over to us within two months of, of when they started in water work. Um, well ahead of schedule and under budget. It really lends itself to good communication. We had weekly meetings with Turnigan from the beginning, right after they got the contract, and um, included us whenever they had questions they, they asked us. Whenever they had stuff they needed us to look at, they put it on, on a, a website. We could access it and approve it right there. It was all, all really seamless. And getting the contractor involved in the beginning with the designer really helped the contractor in their strengths. You know, the contractor's got a say in what the designer is building. He knows what their strengths are, so he can say, you know what, maybe if we do this, we've had a lot of success with, success with it in the past, that might be better as long as it still meets the engineering requirements. And it, it all worked out really, really well. Thanks, Mark. So with that, let's have Mark come up and talk a little bit about HUNA. The Hoon Totem Corporation, when they would get cruise ships in, they would have to lighter the passengers off the cruise ships in groups of 40 or 50 people at a time. That made it difficult to get many people off the cruise ships. Sometimes people didn't want to get into a lighter facility. Uh, so the Hoona Totem folks got together with the city of Hoona. Uh, they got a grant from the state for $14.7 million. Uh, Hoona Totem put up the rest of the money for what was essentially a $25 million project you can see here challenging project to work on. Uh, Turnigan, who were the marine contractors on it, did a fabulous job in very difficult conditions. We had some schedule slippage because of a permitting issue with an IHA that uh, we had three different uh, project managers from uh, the NIMPS organization. The second one left, didn't tell anybody she was gone. We discovered that uh, we hadn't had any work on the permit for about three months. That slipped our schedule a little bit. I work real well with uh, Jason to uh, come up with a revision to the schedule. Julian did a great job of helping us figure out how we wanted to do that. We had hoped to have the cruise ship done uh, in time to get the last ship in 2015. It turns out we got the first ship in 2016, uh, and they had to work through the winter, which was a much more difficult uh, situation. Icy Strait Point is appropriately named. Uh, it is cold, the wind blows, it is tough working conditions. Uh, in addition to the working conditions we had out there, we had some differences in the uh, subsurface uh, geology, uh, different site conditions. Instead of being able to vibrate a lot of pile, uh, we wound up having to uh, drill a lot of pile in. Uh, Turnigan went to work on that, uh, brought in some great people to make that happen. Their superintendent was really terrific. Uh, I sound like a commercial for, uh, for Turnigan, and I don't mean to, but they're really good people to work with. I have, uh, I've done about $8 billion worth of construction management and design build projects over a 37-year career, and uh, this was sort of, I hope, the capstone of, of my career. I've retired three times, uh, got brought back into uh, to help the people at the Huna Totem and, and go to work on it. Um, it was a, an LLC between the city of Huna and uh, the Huna Totem Corporation. Uh, those two entities hadn't always had smooth and easy relations. One of the th jobs that I had as the owner's rep and eventually the project manager for, for the thing was to try to bring the two entities together, talk about finances, talk about schedule, do that sort of thing. Uh, and I think we did that fairly successfully. Um, the NTP uh, was issued 
December of 14. I got involved in the job uh, in early November when we started to evaluate uh, the proposals we had from four different organizations. It was a qualifications and cost-based proposal looking at reputation, looking at a variety of factors. Uh, we had some real substantial discussion about bringing Turnigan on. Uh, we thought they were the best qualified, but they didn't have a reputation. They hadn't done work uh, as an organization in Alaska before, but went around and did a very thorough reference check on the people they were proposing on their team. Uh, turned out we were very comfortable with that. Uh, and fortunately, they had uh, decided to uh, use Amanda as the quality manager on it. I had known Amanda uh, from our days together at CH2M Hill. She was doing Oregon Bridges when I was doing the Everett I-5 widening uh, project. And uh, so I was real comfortable with her and, and the way she would work and the quality that we had there. Um, the uh, construction didn't start until June of 15. We had originally wanted to start in March of 15, uh, but the IHA wasn't forthcoming, uh, and we, we, we struggled a bit because of that uh, and put us into, like I say, tough working conditions. Um, turned out we, uh, we wound up as the organization called, called Duck Point Development. Don't ask me where Duck Point Development comes from, but that was the LLC that was the owner's rep on this job. Um, we wound up reporting to the city of Huna. We wound up reporting back to the Huna Totem uh, Corporation. Uh, we wound up reporting back to the banks who had loaned the money for some Uplands buildings that we did. In addition to building uh, the dock uh, there, we also built a new welcome center. You can see over in the upper right corner of it, 7,000 square foot building. That was a bid-build job done by Alaska uh, Commercial Construction had uh, some really good people from Alaska Commercial out there. They also remodeled a, a restaurant uh, that we had, and they built a building under a zip line that was already existing. So we had a few things going, uh, about $25 million worth of uh, design build on the birthing facility itself and, and $8 million on the Uplands facilities. Both were going on. Both contractors worked well together. They were able to loan each other people and equipment when we had to get things done. It was a team effort to, to get the job done on time. And I say that not just in terms of people working together, but people who really had each other's back and covered each other as we went through the job. Uh, Jason will tell you that it wasn't always an easy negotiation between he and I. Uh, we, we had different points of view, but we worked through those different points of view and, and did it in, a, in, I think, a very exemplary sort of manner. This is one of your photos, Amanda. Yeah, she did beautiful, beautiful photos. We put the photos into our monthly progress reports, uh, wrapped the reports around it. The monthly progress reports were a pretty simple thing to do, brought in the information from ACC, brought in the information from Turnigan, put that into a consolidated project report, wrapped around photos of what was accomplished in that month. We also did special reports for the banks who wanted more definitive information about schedule, finance, budget, and that sort of thing. And those were things that, that I was controlling. The reason design build was chosen for the birthing facility was really driven by schedule. We wanted to be able to accommodate the cruise ships for sure in the 2016 season. And uh, our hope was to be able to demonstrate we could birth, facility, birth a ship in 2015. That didn't work because of the permitting issue, but we did get that in. Uh, while we were there, I think they birthed 77, or they brought in 77 cruise ships and lightered people off of 77 different tours. Uh, next year, they're on track for 113 cruise ships. They have really significantly increased participation. They get people on the ground, they get people going through the facilities, they get people going to the city of Huna. And what that really means is they're able to make more money off of each cruise ship. People are able to stay on the ground longer. They're able to you do the zip line. They're able to do the bear tour. They're able to go out and catch halibut, do a lot of things. That was the reason for the birthing facility was to increase the number of people on the ground and increase the revenue to Huna Totem Corporation. Um, it's been a, a very successful project for them. Um, the... Um, Liability issues that we had, um, 
what we did with the design build was allocate the majority of the responsibility to turning in for all of the design and the construction. My responsibility was to review the design for conformance against the plan that we had, the concept we had. And Berger Abam had done a very good job of a concept. Uh, Moffat and Nichols came in and made some suggestions about where we wanted to put reaction dolphins, where we wanted to put mooring dolphins, improve the quality of the project significantly. I think we could have probably done a better job of improving the project if we had taken a little more time to do VE work while we were waiting for our permit, but we never knew when the permit was going to hit, so we didn't get into the VE side of things. But I think there were things that we could have done. And I really suggest strongly that when you get into a design build situation, you afford the designer and the contractor time to go in and VE your concept. You have an idea of, I want to get more cruise ships in, I want more people off the cruise ships faster, or I want to be able to do whatever it is I'm doing with my new facility. Give yourself time and give the designer and the contractor time to go in and say, this is how we can accomplish this. We can probably save schedule. For sure you can save cost. And that's an important thing to be able to do. We had a schedule that we didn't make. And because of the, the schedule slippage on the permitting, we ran over on a cost situation. So just to be straight up about where we were, but we, the Huna Totem Corporation has recovered. They are making a great deal of money with this new facility. It has been very successful for them. Uh, and I strongly recommend uh, you do design build. I've done nine different design build projects. This is the smallest of the ones I've done. This turned out to be about $33 million. I've done a couple of $2 billion projects in that same kind of vein. A little more challenging on the $2 billion side when you're doing an industrial facility for an Intel or a Samsung. But the same concepts apply. You want to be able to have a team you can work with, people you can trust. You want to be able to communicate very effectively both within the team and then outside to the rest of the world. I mean, that, that is a critical element of making a project successful. In, in a town like Huna, in a small community like is on Chichigoff, there was a lot of expectation that we'd be able to generate local jobs for people. That was one of the, the major things that wanted to happen. The problem is you need to look at the skill sets that are available in the small communities. You don't have people who are pile bucks. You don't have people who can do specialized welding. You don't have people who can do the electrical installation. So you need to find opportunities uh, for those people. And in this case, we used a lot of upland fill. We moved a lot of rock and soil on the uplands projects uh, and labor for those. And we we're able to satisfy many of the community desires for local jobs. And I think that was a success as well, so in terms of what we were able to do. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you about the project, except I'm real pleased to have done it. I'm pleased to have worked with uh, Turnigan, with Amanda, and I want to say that uh, I love Transpax uh, pontoon. It's a uh, 50 by 400 uh, pontoon. And uh, it, it performs beautifully out there. It's been a real pleasure to work on that job. Thank you, Mark. Um, next, here's Dan to talk about Petro Marine. Good morning. So Petro Marine's Sitka South fuel terminal is a relatively simple private project that really is a story mostly about uh, very fast track uh, design and, and delivery. Um, and uh, also real, real close collaboration with a project owner. Petro Marine uh, acquired this, uh, this particular facility several years ago. Uh, they sort of inherited a, a facility that had a lot of deferred maintenance. And uh, from the time that they picked it up, they operated it and performed annual uh, deferred maintenance projects and uh, spent, spent a lot of time trying to bring the facility up to snuff. Uh, in uh, winter of 2016, um, they, uh, they had their operations folks do a real thorough uh, inspection of the, of the facility, and they realized while they didn't truly have a ticking time bomb, they had uh, a project that had been band-aided long enough that it, was, uh, it didn't meet their standards for uh, environmental stewardship, uh, didn't meet their standards for user safety and, and functionality, um, didn't meet their standards for uh, spill prevention and, and, uh, and containment. Um, 
and they, they realized that it, it represented a liability that they needed to, uh, to uh, get rid of. Um, and it also offered an opportunity to, to clean slate the facility, uh, to uh, reorient the dock so that uh, it, it worked better with the prevailing winds, um, and just, just to do a, <clears throat> a full-on uh, revamp of the facility. So in April of uh, 2016, they issued a, a, a RFP for design bid or design build services. And by May of 2016, they had issued a, a firm fixed price contract for uh, delivery of the project. What that, uh, that contract triggered two things that, that happened almost immediately. Uh, number one was, uh, was uh, a, a, an immediate round table with Petro Marine Management operations personnel, uh, their own uh, mechanical installations, crews, uh, and uh, electrical subcontractors uh, in Sitka. And over the course of a, a three-day round table, uh, established um, the real finer points of, uh, of, of the project details. Um, the, the, the contract was based on uh, their RFP, which stated some, some fairly broad-based criteria. Uh, they, they gave an indication of how they wanted to reorient the facility, uh, an indication of the, the basic minimum dimensions of the new facility, um, some criteria on how it had to orient uh, to the neighboring property owners to minimize any uh, access restrictions to, to the neighboring properties. Um, and gave a wish list of, of general details, uh, m some materials preferences, um, some, uh, some general wish list items as far as the, the spill prevention and containment elements, um, spill prevention, boom storage, uh, some details on their, their retail sales building that they, they wanted to have for point of sale on the float. Um, and other, otherwise, it was a fairly, uh, fairly loosely structured RFP that gave, uh, gave the bidders uh, quite a bit of flexibility in what they offered. This led to the, the design roundtable upon issuance of the contract that, that allowed us to sit down with the, the owner's representatives and subcontractors and, and really dial in the fine, fine details. While that was going on, uh, concurrently, uh, we were conducting uh, consultation with the, the permitting agencies, uh, the goal being to, to really establish if there would be any potential showstopper issues with, with permitting, um, or if we were talking more uh, uh, just general restrictions on, on means and methods of, of installation. Uh, by the end of June, uh, Consultation with the agencies had had determined that uh, there there weren't any showstoppers. Uh, that uh, we were really just talking about means and methods issues, and uh, gave everyone the confidence to proceed with uh, uh, purchase of, of materials and and manufacturing of the product. Um, from that point moving forward, manufacturing. Uh, was was moving concurrent with uh, final uh, acquisition of environmental permits uh, by November of, of 2016 uh, environmental permits had been issued uh, by the second week of December the project was was loaded on a barge in Anacortes floats gangway sales building uh, boom storage building piling uh, and uh, headed north for Sitka. Uh, by the first week of uh, January, the, the barge had managed to beat its way through the winter storms and, and arrive on site. Uh, Turnigan's Brightwater Barge arrived at the same time um, and uh, proceeded into demolition of the existing facility. Uh, in, in about two weeks' time, they had, they had demoed the existing, uh, drilled, socketed four, 30-inch uh, steel pipe pile into some really nasty bedrock uh, conditions 
and by the uh, the end of January, uh, the project was turned over to the to the owner for their crews to come in and self-perform the installation of the mechanical, and the facility was operational for the uh, onslaught of the primary boating season in Sitka. So, why was design build chosen? Really, the schedule dictated everything. So. Uh, this facility is located at the, the south end of Sitka Channel. Um, it's, it's adjacent A and B Harbor, Crescent Harbor, uh, Sealing Cove, and, and uh, so it, just an awful, awful lot of uh, small to mid-sized boat activity. This is, this is the go-to facility for uh, a large share of the boats in, in, uh, in Sitka. It's also the, the first stop in anybody coming from the south and uh, coming into Sitka. So. A real, real critical uh, high volume facility for, for Petro Marine's fueling operations. Um, obviously, they, they, they knew they needed to, to get rid of the, of the liability of, of that existing facility, but they could not afford to have the facility down for any part of the boating season. Uh, and the community would, would not have appreciated that. And that, that plays also into the, the construction window. They just, they really needed to minimize the amount of downtime of the facility to maintain operations to, to service their client base. Unique aspects of this project. So uh, the, the collaboration with the owner was critical. Petro Marine has their own crews that uh, design and install their mechanical systems. And uh, if you've seen any of Petro Marine's recent installations, you'll see that they are, they are really, really top shelf as far as amenities on the float, as far as um, their attention to detail on the, on the mechanical systems, the plumbing, the, the, the dispensers. Um, it, they, they put a, a tremendous amount of thought and effort into making these facilities incredibly user friendly. And uh, that, that Accommodating that requires uh, uh, quite a bit of coordination with uh, the structure, structural design of the float itself. Some other uh, oddball unique aspects of the project. One of the things that wasn't able to be determined at the time of pre-consultation with the agencies was how to dispose of the existing floats. Uh, Sitka Channel is, is uh, graced with the presence of an invasive species called a, a tunicate that has colonized uh, uh, most of the structures or many of the structures in Sitka Channel. Uh, it's, a, a, it's referred to by marine biologists as rock vomit. And uh, if you've ever seen it, you'll, you'll see that's a pretty good name for it. Um, that, that invasion of, of the species limits the ability to uh, or options for disposing or reuse of, of any structures that, that come out of Sitka Channel. Um, there has been some precedents for, for cleaning the structures uh, on, on previous projects, transient float. Um, there was also precedent for reusing uh, floats from the channel in other projects in the channel, uh, but uh, the agencies weren't able to commit uh, up front as to how that could be handled. So um, we had to offer the owner a lot of flexibility in, in how to deal with that. Uh, otherwise, the, the default would have been upland disposal of, of those structures, which would have been extremely costly. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the existing floats were, were disposed of in, in, in a variety of manners. A couple of them were reused uh, Repermitted for, for projects in the channel, uh, and a couple of them were, were hauled out off site and, and cleaned and used at uh, locations outside the channel. Lastly, the permitting, because of the fast track nature of the job, we, in, in, in consultation with Turnigan, decided that really the only way to get this project shoehorned into the short window that, that was required of Petro Marine. Uh, that the, the only option was to proceed uh, with pile installation without an IHA, um, which, which was a risk that, that we as the contractor assumed, uh, but felt that it was a fairly safe bet because of the li limited nature of the in-water work. Uh, four piles secure the, the, uh, the float, um, so relatively short duration of, of in-water work, even though the the work was 
very difficult and challenging. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the, the uh, species of concern sightings did, did, not, uh, did not impact uh, the, the project schedule at all and turned out to be a, a, a good bet. So we were able to deliver uh, a couple weeks ahead of schedule and uh, with zero changes to the, uh, the project cost. It's really important to go ahead and highlight other people as well. A lot of these projects have been turnigans, um, but the fact is, is we have some other really great contractors in the area that also do excellent design build. There's a lot of engineers in this room and, um, and other locations that have been involved in design build projects that have been very successful. So it's almost lunchtime. I'm gonna zip through just a couple slides really quick so that what we're trying to convey here is that design build has done been done throughout Alaska on a variety of different types of projects. So this one, um, in perfect timing, my, my Kiwit guy just showed up. So Gnome Navigational Improvements, this was a project, and I know the core touched on it a little bit as well, this was actually a combination, it was a design bid build project, but a component of this project had a design build element. So remember how earlier we were talking about that you can combine these methods sometimes? So on this particular project, Kiwit Manson was the a JV um, contractor on this, and they actually did the bridge portion of this as design build. So I wanted to highlight that. Port Lions Ferry Dock, this was a PPM project, and um, it was, I, I believe P&D was the partner on this project as well, and I was not involved in these, so I'm not an expert on these projects, but I just wanted to highlight a couple things about these jobs, and that is that cost certainty was a really important aspect on this, and collaboration with the owner. Again, we've, you've been hearing that a lot. Um, it maximized the ability um, for them to take those funds and do the most with it that they could and very little contingency available on that one. Also the White Pass Railroad Dock, that was design build, again PPM. You can see from the duration of the schedule, it was a, again consolidated um, effort there, and it consisted of retrofitting a freight barge into a floating berth. The challenging site conditions included drilling through an up, unstable riprap slope and steeply sloping bedrock. And then this, we all toured the Carl E. Moses Harbor last year at the conference, and that was a great opportunity. What I don't think we touched on as much is that that was also a design build project. I'm not sure everybody recognizes that, but it was a $30 million design build with PPM and P&D, um, with Transpac support as well, and um, that, that was a no contractor initiated change order project. You know that the area there always raves about the project success, um, and Again, the time frame there is really quite impressive. So kudos to all of those um, folks that were involved.